All right, so when I'm working with this particular student and they love doing environment designs, they love doing landscapes, they love creating fantasy illustration that has deep, rich uh, context. So a lot of that does come back to uh, you know scene design. And for, for students that are experienced in that, I usually say to them, how about you come up with a project proposal, we'll talk about it on paper, we'll plan something out, and we'll go through it step by step to kind of create it. So if this is the first kind of real scene that you're doing and trying to legitimize, we'll just go at it in a very systematic and straightforward way so we can kind of catch any kind of error along the way. So this is what this one student, they wanted to design a fantasy witch type of cottage in a nice kind of forest. So this is what the initial proposal looked like and the original thumbnails. I had sent them a few uh, instructions on how to basically kind of whip up some silhouette design and we tried that approach first. So again, they, they would listen, um, they would list their reference they would show what kind of what is inspiring them, kind of the mood and the emotion they're kind of playing towards. We work out the shape language. I give a whole uh, demonstration and talk on shape language before we get to this point. And then any additional relevant general info. And then from there, we'll kind of, they might send them to me over Skype. We'll go over them like, you know, go with, of course this student didn't number them. I, I was like, you gotta number these things so I can reference them. But I was like, you know, either go with A, B, or C, and then start refining them. So you can see on the second pass, there are, of course, appropriate lettered, and we start to find the, the other uh, kind of shape language, the interior design, and the uh, subdivision of these silhouettes to really get in there and start working through the design. So, you know, this student was just cranking these things out, you know, revising them, pushing and pulling some things, and then, of course, we would have that talk and that sit down. And basically from there, we would uh, kind of ref uh, refine it, uh, revise it, uh, keep pushing it forward, and then work out the scene comps, which you will see in the, the entire kind of painting and in, in which you will see in the overpaint process and where I, I show kind of various tips on art direction and how to push uh, the design and scene forward. So let's get into that. All right, so the first thing we were really going over was the student's final sort of line art with this and we wanted to kind of address any kind of major perspective issues any kind of elements with scale as you can see I can go right over the original design uh, view of it and work out some of basically what's kind of going on with the shapes and the proportions and that's what we were trying to fix first this went from a small cottage basically uh, without knowing it they upscaled it to make it more like a robust five-star inn so just changing the size of the windows basically the door frame sort of elements like that that bring everything down to um, human scale really can fix that pretty quickly so again we we talked about grad gathering a few more uh, references you know that would be kind of relevant how we can use some of the information in those apply it to this stage of the design so again we're revising that design we're taking what you already kind of have worked out what we already thought what was working and kind of tweaking it and fine-tuning it getting some last little min, um, bit of elements that weren't necessarily coming together as nicely as we wanted to before. And so I basically just show this approach. Look, if you want to just do a clean art, line art version, this is how you can kind of address that sort of um, process at this stage in the game, where some elements of this are lacking particular uh, details that will help it, and how, of course, we can refine some of that information to make it feel a little bit more legit as well. And that has to do largely with the, some of the texture information, some of how the key shapes are working, and uh, some of the actual functional details. This is a good place for the chimney. How about the foundation? How is this working? And of course, how are the half-timbered uh, beams and structures working within the, um, the other elements, such as windows and such. So we try to address all that at this stage for this particular student. Again, this of course varies for the individual depending on what they're trying to do, what they're trying to create, and where their interest lies. This student's very good at um, you know drawing. They had a, a lot of nice line art in their portfolio, so we're kind of going down this particular path for this student because it works well. So we're again trying to just work through the design, definitely fixing some of those uh, issues that were happening, and cleaning cleaning it up along the way as well. So it's nearly getting there and we're gonna jump into uh, the next stage in a, in a moment here. But this is a great way to really refine your design and I, the, one of the biggest tips I can suggest at this point is to not settle for your first design, not settle for your first drawing. They're never the best and they usually have a lot more problems than if you keep going with things. So like as you can see in this initial drawing here, what I like to do is just 
draw the the, the house or the element um, whatever you're drawing in very basic shapes first almost with very little detail and then kind of constructing the forms from there rather than jumping into drawing detail and scale and everything like really early on it definitely helps to kind of just work it out in terms of the shapes then apply detail to those shapes and then kind of uh, makes sense. Okay, where where is this house? Is it does it have uh, you know land kind of coming up into these curves? How can we add or subtract a shape from here and basically refine the heck out of it? Is that the best place for the tower? Maybe we can move it over. The next thing we do, uh, this student did a handful of compositional thumbs. They weren't the most experienced in them, but they were good enough to get our conversation rolling, and that's really all I asked for. Like these are sketches, these are thumbnails. Uh, unless they're for a particular client, they generally just need to be legible enough for you to kind of plan your situation for, uh, you know, for, for the next painting. So I, I do try to instill good habits uh, with, with the students, and that's just getting something that you may allegedly present to a client. So they don't have to be super refined, but enough to keep the conversation moving. So we're taking basically some of the best parts of these designs. And of course, I start off by asking, you know, what are, you, what are your favorites out of the lot? What do you think is working best for you? So we, I can basically help the students start to curate their own sort of design, um, design and decision making. So I, I give my, you know, what I think works and what they think works. We kind of make a mishmash. I started copying pasted pasted a lot of the ideas. And then basically from here, I show this is how we could take this kind of foundation of an idea and we can really break down the design of the composition. And that's exactly what I'm doing. And as I've shown in many videos prior, let's try to get this scene that's working with, you know, clumps and lumps of shapes in tone. And let's just break it down very uh, simply in almost a rather abstract way minus the very representational house shape here uh, to see how we can get things working and my recommendation for something like this is always to come down to the focal point start with that and where is its relation in in regards to the horizon we kind of drove the put the house up on a hill to kind of celebrate it make it feel kind of cute and um, empowered up there because it's all about this hill and then we're designing the bigger shapes in the scene around that so maybe where's the footpath uh, where is the patches of grass? Where are the hills? And I'm, I'm lightly drawing in contour shapes around some of this too to start to explore how some of the, the actual geog um, geography around the, uh, the uh, house will work. Not geography, but the, the geographical location. Sorry, it's been a long week. Um, anyways, trying to work out some of these other shapes too. So again, I'm not trying to draw grass, I'm not necessarily trying to draw rocks, but I'm trying to feel my way through the shapes of the scene at a very basic level to start. This house is probably about as detailed as I want something like that to get at this stage anyways. Next, I can draw these big, bigger kind of um, uh, shapes in the background starting with the uh, the hills and then working out to where the the shapes for the sky may peek through so like this might be just a giant hill maybe I want to subdivide that hill so I could break that big shape down to this medium shape and from there I can decide if I need to include any smaller shapes in the integration of that so these compositions and breaking down the scene is all about figuring out the relationship to these shapes Having a good variety of them is just usually pleasing to most people's eyes. So that's kind of the approach we're taking with this. A lot of this can will most likely be covered in the long run, but at least we know structurally where things are going to stand and where we're going to build from there. So again, I'm carving literally right into the initial shapes I did to get a little bit more geometry to, to them. Uh, if I can word it that way. So it's like this might be a bit of a tough the grass. Maybe this is a slight, uh, you know, slope or slant and the, the elevation changes. Uh, but again, I, start, I like to figure out the bigger problems first. Uh, this is again a forest and I haven't even worked out where the major tree elements because I want to see where the ground's going to be at uh, beforehand. All right, so I'm going to start in almost an abstract way again, just figure out maybe where some of these holes or these greater shapes are with the trees in the background, and then work more toward the foreground ones to see if I like the positioning of them. Then I can add more literal elements, like is there going to be a picket fence? Are we going to do you know shrubs, bushes, and foliage? Where would be a great place to stick those? Um, 
So it definitely becomes a very like literal problem solving element, it, like like working out a, a nice robust puzzle, because we're trying to make everything work toward that house and not kind of compromising that at any stage of the design. You could add a character into this, you could add a bird sitting on, the, whatever kind of flavor details you could put on this, it's always still about that house. That's what's most important and that's how I try to show the students to make a very direct and bold uh, composition. Uh, next up, you know, this is actually jumps a week later, the student came through and did this painting and what often happens and at this stage for the student, as you can kind of start to work out here, is even if we start with a, a fairly solid drawing, and the student didn't go exactly one to one with my original one. You know, with, we went and added. She um, she added a bridge and worked out you know different types of trees and stuff, which is great and all. But what can happen as I keep turning on and off, you see that flicker really quickly. Is a lot of the shapes can get lost in the rendering process. So even if you start off with a fairly dynamic drawing and foundation you know detail gets <laughs> compromises structure and this happens a lot in figure drawing as well you'll see often you know just you know people are working in figure stuff a lot and do lots of gestures and stuff they always exaggerate the figure maybe up to four times the amount that they think they'll need to because things just haven't for a lot of artists generally things have a way of stiffening up a bit when you start to tighten up and add detail so that's basically my first kind of instinct when I'm approaching a paint over like this is let's kind of like weed out a lot of the detail and just get the shapes of not only color and light but form to work as well so in a way I'm just stripping and painting over a lot of the brush uh, the hard brush work the the grass detail the leaf detail the uh, the thatching the, the texture on the house whatever it may be and I'm just literally trying to get this thing to work in regards to shapes and color and light first because then I figure out uh, for me most often what works from there if I can get it to work like that then it's easy to add the detail on. I can pick where I want detail and how much I want that detail. But I, at least I know structurally the scene's going to be holding up and working. So yeah, using some of the lasso tool to kind of get in there, make quick dirty selections, figure out what's going to be in direct light, what's going to be a cast shadow, what's going to be the, you know, I'm going through the lighting principles to figure out how some of these um, different elements of the scene will be interacting because there's numerous little problems throughout the whole scene. I don't have particular reference that I'm going off of with this. I'm just looking at the students and trying to show kind of what's there. And again, there there's a lot of issues at the perspective with the the tower, the scale of the house. That's that was a problem and an ongoing joke throughout uh, our conversations with this. It's like every every time she went and, and did a revision of the house, the scale would always make it be like it was for like toddlers or um, you know dwarfs or something and that that wasn't by intentions but it you know we kept catching it and it was it was always this funny how things always naturally just kind of went that day so we all have our our own kind of ticks and quirks and and muscle memory kind of uh, instincts that just kind of push things in certain ways unintended as it as it turns out sometimes so see, I'm just taking basically at this stage from blocking out a painting you want to use the big <laughs> the big thick brushes early on and just block things out and that's all I'm doing is literally just blocking things out I'm not looking for uh, those details I'm not looking for a lot of the the smaller things that would make a painting like this look absolutely stunning I'm just trying to get the shapes to work and with the shapes if I can get the color to work on top of that since this is a color piece then uh, that will be doing a great service to it as well so it's like you know something like this catch making more negative space on the, the foreground tree since it's so close getting rid of or, or fixing the tangent with this tree covering up the roof here which was a huge problem and, and evidently just kind of moving through and changing the scale of a lot of the trees in the background even in the foreground here upscaling essentially everything to make the the forest look really old look at uh, add a bit of mi a sense of mystery to it and yeah you can kind of see this is this this part was even done a little later in the week when the student actually started planning out some of the uh, interior of the house. So we're going all in on this because she loves concept design. She loves coming up with these architectural renderings of sort. And she's already kind of done them uh, with the computer before, but uh, mostly in 3D, so very little experience painting it. So that's kind of where we're just focusing with this particular student. Find their interests, what they really like doing, what, and of course what they're interested in, so concept design and everything like that, and try to find a good strategy and technique that works for them and their style. 
So I'm not looking to fix every little micro detail on an overpaint like this, just to address a lot of these uh, more problematic things. Uh, the detail, you know, coincidentally ends up being the least of the problems. There, I would say some of the brushwork and how uh, the textures are handled, you know, throughout the scene, particularly on the house here, comes off as a, a little heavy handed and that part can um, use improvement, but that's something that would probably come up in, you know, in a future discussion and we'd go over some references and how to imply detail rather than uh, simply show a lot of it and how to break up the rhythm of that detail so it doesn't become too static. Which ends up more or less becoming a problem for a lot of uh, uh, more novice painters when you, you see a, something like a thatched roof in this case or, or a field of grass or a tree branch full of trees. Uh, a lot of our first instinct is to go in there and paint a lot of little detail using a lot of the same size brush. But again, if you can break that down into simple shapes of light and shadow first, then going in to kind of breaking apart those uh, bigger shapes into a few smaller medium sized ones with light, uh, you know, with subtle amplifications of where the light's coming, you can show a lot more uh, form, you know, shape without getting too heavy handed with the detail. And that's usually where the trick is. So one example is of such thing as like on this tree. Uh, and so what I'm doing is breaking it first down into a giant kind of singular shape. I've lightly hinted where a little bit of light might be catching there on the bottom. And then we'll kind of come back to uh, imply the rest of the detail there after I block out uh, some of the remainder uh, remaining shapes in this uh, sky box. All right, so I'm getting some of these negative shapes going on with this tree because it really didn't have any before. It, it just, it went from trunk to like just a big fan wad of branches. And I do want to show a little bit of depth. So showing a little bit of the background peek through there is the perfect opportunity to do such thing. So when I'm making like these shapes of trees and the negative space in between the trees, I'm always trying to assess the, the pattern and the rhythm of how I do those. Are some of them big and long or some of them fat and skinny? Uh, some of them uh, tall and uh, or wide. Uh, always kind of these, these contrasting uh, terms or uh, visual kind of languages to help make that the pattern and the rhythm look uh, the most kind of organic and uh, le uh, the least amount of repetitiveness. All right, so back at the tree, I'm just showing a little bit of this occluded light kind of coming underneath in the... Uh, the branches, and I'm moving that down into this core shadow area that I'm, I'm showing there. So this core shadow is all one giant shape, and I'm bringing in the ambient light coming from the bottom, chiseling that up. So see, with a few brush strokes, we can kind of imply a lot of detail there with a, a greater range of shapes without actually going in there and painting every little notch of bark. That, again, would get uh, very boring and um, wouldn't add uh, to the greater sense of the picture in, in this particular case. And in a production sense, it doesn't. If you're doing some majestic landscape uh, painting for fine art sake, yeah, you could you could probably have the time and the, the willpower and everything to, to do that sort of thing, and it would be appreciated a lot more. But uh, production designers necessarily won't care <laughs> about that detail in that bark, um, at least not in a, in a background uh, tree like that. So now I'm getting a little bit more variety in some of the brush strokes, applying some of that, the, the thatch roof, the layering of that, and how it's clumped and lumped into bigger shapes, rather than just going through and you know, getting super repetitive with the, uh, the brush mark. Fixing, uh, or adjusting, I should say, the perspective slightly on the house, and tying in some of these background shapes finally. These are, of course, I'm like I did in the original sketch, I'm going back to implying some of the uh, major shrubs, bush, uh, bushes, and uh, foliage. But I know I've kind of changed a great amount here, you know, at this point. And I, I, of course, my goal is not to go back and to tell every student, hey, you got to redo 90% of the picture, 70% of the picture. But, you know, the more stakes they make in a scene like this, it's, in all honesty, the better. I love to help students get to a new portfolio level each and every piece. But if it takes getting a couple of these sort of pieces to get a lot of these bad habits out of their system, then that's 
absolutely invaluable. Something that, you know, without the help of somebody more experienced, they'll be making these same mistakes on their own for years into months to come. So let's just find these bad habits, break them first, and then start building you know, much better ones from there, basically. And this kind of uh, kind of uh, comes to the conclusion here for uh, how far we're gonna take this for this particular purpose. Uh, so just to make a few final thoughts and uh, closing uh, points. Now, I have a copy of the original you know, from when we started in uh, my suggested paint over. So basically when we're creating these images, uh, you know, mostly for online and stuff and to build portfolios, remember we're going to have a very small kind of window of opportunity to attract a new viewer, to make the audience kind of connect with our imagery. And they're going to first see these images on Instagram, on cell phones, on thumbnails, on ArtStation, perhaps Google. Uh, they're going to end up being very small. So if I reduce on my screen, right, the image to probably the approximate size uh, that will the viewer will initially engage with them at, uh, it's pretty small. So you have to really fight to make the image absolutely readable and appealing at a very kind of small scale. Uh, so here's a, again the compare and contrast. Th th this again wasn't at all the worst place to start. The, the colors were already working pretty good. It's the structure of the shapes that uh, it ended up getting really hard to read, particularly in this area, uh, this area over here, and of course the background and stuff. So that's really what I focused on here. The colors did get tweaked very slightly, but by and far, this is the same image. It's saying the exact same thing. Everything is in the same position, but we're utilizing the space a lot more. We're, the, the image is organization, is a lot more kind of uh, refined, and uh, the colors, the shapes, and the values are grouped. And so therefore, it makes a little bit easier of a read, a little bit, uh, hopefully, a greater chance of alluring a new viewer. So. Yeah, that's just a little bit of the recap. Think on the macro over the micro at first when you have things kind of looking pretty good like this on your screen, you know, pretty far zoomed out and it's looking good in your navigator, you know, give yourself the okay, the pat on the back, maybe consult with a friend, then blow it up and add any kind of remaining detail you want. All right, but thank you for watching. Uh, let me know if you have any questions in regards to any technique that I used here. This is all done in Adobe Photoshop. And yeah, I'm booking for September as of the posting of this video. So if you, uh, you need help, be sure to check that out and uh, take care and have a great summer. I'll be posting some more videos shortly.